Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial on ISTKB foundation level sample paper discussions where we are talking about the tips and tricks and various time management skills related to success of this examination. In this tutorial, we are getting started with the next set that is set B and we shall be looking forward to again start with the chapter one of this particular set to understand what could be more possible, tricky and especially those difficult questions which can be asked to you in the examination as different sets basically categorize a different level of examination cushion so you would have a flavor of easy moderate and hard throughout all these different sets to get started the very first question from the very first chapter of set b is right here the question says which of the following is an example of why testing is necessary Considering that the second topic uh, of the chapter one, why testing is necessary, has told you a lot many things uh, in a very nutshell way that how testers contribute to the overall success of the product uh, by contributing, participating, and uh, it's very important for a tester to be very engaged and involved uh, by finding defects and later in the life cycle by conducting dynamic testing to uh, conduct failures in order to identify them. Right, so let's go ahead and quickly look at the option because the context is not clear and that in that case we always read the options to get the required clarity. So the option A says uh, dynamic testing increases quality by causing test objects to fail in ways that could never be achieved by the user. I think this option looked very clear and very crisp to be the right answer but however if you pay attention to this, this option has some words which should be paid attention to in more detail. For example, if you read the option once again, it says that the objects to fail in ways that could never be achieved by the user. Number one, of course, testing is not about doing those failures which uh, will never occur in the real world, right? If you think you know that these are those failures which the user will never experience or never engage in, then why are we doing testing? Testing is not about just conducting variety of failures. Con testing is more about those failures which would come across the people and we don't want them to suffer with these unnecessary obstacles when using the system. So quality in a system is not defined by conducting unnecessary failures. <clears throat> the failures which are very important for the end users or to the success of the product which is in turn making user happy is very important for us. So this is how some options can really look a little tricky. And uh, you may feel that this is absolutely the right answer, but uh, by engaging the words like users, etc. But point to be noted, why would we conduct those failures which the users will never see? So that's not something which you should consider until unless we have anything better than this, okay? So let's go ahead and uh, we have the option B. Option B says static testing is used by the developers to identify failures in their program code earlier than can be achieved through the dynamic testing. Indeed, why not? Of course, static testing and developers is a diverting keyword used here. But if you pay attention a little more uh, uh, with attention, with uh, patience, you would understand that static testing also includes a way static analysis and that is about code review and of course developers make use of them right so it's not that static testing is all about only reviews static testing is of two types review and static analysis static analysis is code review and certainly used by developers and early in the life cycle before the code can be dynamically tested so of course this is uh, uh that's one option which particularly matters but this is not that is Again, the context is, of course, this option is absolutely great, but the question is not about it. The question says how testing adds value, not static analysis, right? It's a review part, that too by developers. So let's go to option C. Option C says static analysis provides evidence into customers that the elements of the system that provide no outputs are fit for releases. Multiple words here. I think you don't need me by now to tell you why the option C looks uh, a little uh, out of the scope. Number one, uh, we are talking about static analysis. That is about code review, which is pretty much internal. On top of it, you told me that you need customers, right? And customers here are not someone who is interested in any kind of evidences of the static analysis, which is code review. And uh, the third part is elements of the system that provide no outputs are fit for release. If, if, if it is no output, then how come exactly it is fit for release, right? 
So, you know, if you get any of these catches, right, there are three catches. If you get any of these three catches, you know how to select the answer. My job is to give you multiple possible ways to detect that why this option may not be right. So number one is static analysis results are not something we really bother about uh, in terms of quality of testing. Second, customers are not involved uh, to get to know about these things. And third, if it is not fit for purpose, then why would you go for the release? Right, it's uh, not having significant outputs. So that's pretty much. But option D here says uh, reviews increase the quality of requirement specifications and lead to fewer changes being needed in derived work product. Of course, this was one of the straightforward point in the syllabus talking about that how static testing saves our time and effort in dynamic testing by being conducted early in the life cycle by detecting defects uh, in the work products which could be eliminated much earlier itself. So cost of fixing the defect reduces with respect to static testing, and at the same time, it reduces the overall time for the dynamic testing. With that context put together, the right answer for this particular question is D, that is reviews, increase the quality of requirement specification and lead to fewer changes being needed in the derived work products. So sometimes you do understand that the options may look very pretty correct based on their statement, but sometimes it is not relevant to that of the question. So that is where we, we will just feel one thing, that is uh, the, there are multiple correct answers. Whenever you feel this, understand you're missing something very important. Either the question is wrong, or you have not read the question properly, or this option is not relevant to the question. Okay, so always be in sync that what the question is and what the option is trying to say. So options may be right, but this is, this is not what the question is asking you, all right? So let's go ahead. And the next question we have is uh, question number two. It says, which of the following statement about QA and QC is correct? Now, again, uh, many people do come to this playlist directly thinking of uh, a sample question discussions. So if you have not been through my tutorials, it's very important to go through that because we do have some definitions defined there as per the syllabus. So. Let's go ahead and see the option. Option A says QA is performed as a part of testing. Not at all. QA is about defining the process. That is quality assurance. And uh, quality assurance does not talk about performing the activity. QA talks about determining the methods, approaches, process to achieve quality in a product, which is more of like test planning. Okay. And QC is the activity where we perform and implement this uh, process, method, and techniques to achieve the quality in the product. If in case you have any doubts, I have a card on the top that will take you back to my tutorial playlist. Watch that video, you'll have the required justification. Okay, so coming back to option B, option B says testing is performed as a part of QC. I think that's very clear. C says testing is another term for QC. Now, uh, it is, but not that way, right? It is not a differentiation between Q and QC. So, and uh, QC includes many of the work, right? It's like executing the test cases, setting up the environment. So QC is all that what you plan is getting conducted. So analyzing the work product, designing the test cases, setting up the environment, preparing the data, executing the test cases, everything comes as a part of QC. So it's just not one word that is testing, right? Because sometimes testing treated as, as uh, executing the test cases. And again, test, testing can be static testing, dynamic testing. So just one word cannot be satisfying the word QC. And uh, option D says here, testing is performed as a part of the QA. Uh, not at all. I think this goes pretty much uh, in line with the option A. Option A is just inverted to put it uh, in this fashion. So I think A and B can be easily eliminated and you can just spend time with B and C to get a clarity. But if you have been through the tutorials, you don't need to do that. That's the reason I always say that, watch my tutorials and then come back to this uh, uh, playlist of sample question discussion. <clears throat> Anyways, in that context put together, very straightforward, the right answer to this particular question is B, testing is performed as a part of QC, but not QA. QA determines the process, whereas QC performs the required activity. Let's move on to the next question. The next question we have is question number three. And the question number three is talking about one of the principles of testing states that exhaustive testing is impossible. 
which of the following is an example of addressing the principles in practice? Again, we do have seven standard principles and each of the principle talks in particular about something and that's very crucial for someone to really have unique definition to each of these principles and a deep dive of every single principle that what exactly does that talk about and what is more important to uh, have this principle in testing. And for that itself, uh, with that information, you would be able to answer this question in the examination. So let's go ahead with the options here. Option A says, uh, creating test cases that cover every possible specified output. This is contradicting with the principle number two. Principle number two says exhaustive testing is impossible, where exhaustive testing is all about creating all possible combination of inputs to test them. And this is impossible as for the principle because we just cannot come up with all possible combination of inputs in the given timeline for testing. And this is where option A is conflicting with that of the uh, you know, principle given to us. Exhaustive testing is impossible, so we don't create uh, all possible combinations. Whereas option B says, documenting all possible test input variations and prioritizing them these based on importance. Again, See, number one, I think if you know the principle, you don't have to waste your time. You don't understand that you're talking about all possible test inputs, which is one way, again, exhaustive, and it's not about prioritizing them. Okay, prioritizing is a different thing, but this is about coming up with the number of test cases which are desirable to be executed. So again, B goes out of the focus when it comes to the principle, uh, exhaustive testing is impossible. If you look at the option C, option C says, Starting testing as early as possible, that is good, with reviews and other static testing approaches. Okay, that's pretty much good, uh, starting as soon as possible, you know, performing testing early in the life cycle. But again, that's not something which we uh, basically talk about exhaustive testing is impossible because the question again is talking about a principle written in that, that is exhaustive testing is impossible. So. Why would we do that? This is a principle number three, which is dedicated to uh, early testing and uh, that saves time and money. So option C is absolutely correct, but that's not the principle what it is talking about, right? So it's uh, other principle which we talk about. And option D here says that uh, using equivalence partition and boundary value analysis to generate the test cases, exactly. If you remember, uh, we answered this uh, topic or this particular statement in the chapter 4 introduction that the test techniques were created to overcome the principle exhaustive testing is impossible because if exhaustive testing cannot be conducted, then how to determine the definite number of test cases which we need to test the system because we cannot come up with all possible combination. And that is where test techniques were created to reduce your test cases. And this absolutely matches with that of the expectation of this principle that you're using test techniques to derive your test cases uh, because exhaustive testing is not possible. So in that context put together, very straightforward. The right answer to this particular question is D, using equivalence partition and boundary value analysis to generate test cases is certainly going to address and be in line with the principle that is exhaustive testing is impossible. So with that, we give you some, you know, tricky questions, very, uh, you know, easily handled here, but given that you pay that level of attention, of course, my knowledge about the content and the syllabus is different than yours. So do not underestimate that part of thing. You know, you need to have a really good preparation before you can start answering these questions, okay? And again, another advice, if you have just completed a chapter and you're here, please don't do that because it will be blend of multiple things together in the examination, okay? So read the entire six chapters and then look at these sample papers. That's how it makes it better, okay? So that's all from this particular tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning. Thank you.